Thinking Aloud Conversations on the Leading Edge of Knowledge and Discovery with Psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today I want to follow up on my previous monologue on Peter Kingsley's book Catafalque and also discuss the implications of his Jungian analysis for the field of parapsychology. In particular, I want to look at Carl Jung's journey into the underworld. Now, to begin with, Peter Kingsley points out that this is typically a very dangerous journey, and in a sense, Carl Jung risked his own life to journey into the underworld, and he shows us what this means by pointing to a, yeah, <laughs> a painting several hundred years old, depicting Pythagoras, the philosopher Pythagoras, emerging from the underworld with a kind of a sly look, as Peter Kingsley characterizes it, on his face. And there are the assembled uh, followers of the philosopher waiting for his arrival. And you can see on their faces a number of mixed emotions. Some of them are eager and full of anticipation. Others are frightened not knowing what to expect. And this, in a way, is how Peter Kingsley defines the journey into the underworld. That is, he, he says, as long ago as Pythagoras and Empedocles and Parmenides, the early pre-Socratic philosophers who journeyed into the underworld, that that was an important part of their philosophy. But Right away, he says, their followers tried to soften it, tried to make it more palatable for people to digest, to take away the awesome terror involved in the journey to the underworld. And why would that be awesome and so terrible? You, you know, when you think of the fact that practically all the ancient people had a sense of continuity with their ancestors, their ancestors were still alive, the underworld was very real and tangible for them. Why should it be frightening? And why do we, in particular, consider it so frightening? Now, there's a very strange experience phrase, a turn of expression used by Peter Kingsley, very strange. And even though the book is incredibly well documented, as I pointed out, and the volume two is nothing but footnotes. And yet, Peter Kingsley gives us a very dogmatic statement for which he provides no footnotes. And it does have to do with the journey into the underworld. He says that a sacred contract was formed at the very beginning of time between the living and the dead, that all information provided when one journeys into the underworld must be reported for the benefit of the living, but it must be reported exactly as it was given without any distortions. That's the sacred contract. And the implications of that sacred contract formed at the very beginning of time between the living and the dead, this immutable contract, the implications of it are extremely profound, he pro proclaims and, and gives examples which are well documented now with many footnotes in the life of Carl Jung in which Jung understood that he could no longer live for himself alone. The very demand that he simply report what was given to him in the underworld exactly as it was given to him means that he now lives in behalf of both the living and the dead, and therefore never simply for the living alone or for himself alone anymore. And Peter Kingsley goes even further to maintain that once you take that step that you're no longer living just for yourself you become like Christ. You become like a person who is living for others, to give life to the world itself. You are a servant of life. 
a servant of both the living and the dead, a servant of something much larger than yourself. You're no longer living just a subjective life. You are living, in a sense, an objective life, a life devoted to the objectivity of consciousness itself. Now, we can see this, I think, actually in parapsychology, because the funny thing is, parapsychology, you could say that there are two distinct groups of researchers within this tiny discipline of parapsychology. There are those who are researching the question of survival of human consciousness after death, and there are frankly those who are only interested in researching psi abilities, telepathy, clairvoyance, and precognition, psychokinesis, among the living. And uh, for example, I have extensive interviews on the New Thinking Aloud channel with Ed May, who received uh, uh, millions of dollars, ultimately, in funding from the U.S. government to uh, do parapsychology research over a period of well over a decade. Uh, he managed the program. And uh, for many years before he was the manager of the program, he, he was a participant and a senior researcher in the field, but he considers himself a physicalist. And as a physicalist, that means for him, he, he's not at all convinced of any evidence of life after death, that uh, at best it can be explained away as what we call living agent psi, that the supposed communications from the departed are really mediated by the psychic abilities of living people who have precognition and retrocognition, and uh, th there's no reason to ascribe agency to a deceased personality when it could have been a living person. And furthermore, he'd go on to say that some of the claims could be explained away as, as some sort of fraud perpetrated uh, by the living. <laughs> so, uh, that's one example. Now, in general, I think it's fair to say that remote viewers are not concerned particularly with uh, telepathy and clairvoyance with the departed. There's a strong interest in the remote viewing community, however, in communication with aliens. Not gods or deities or devas, so to speak. Uh, Peter Kingsley is very concerned with communication with the gods. In fact, he asks, he says, that the problem is we're only concerned about how the gods are going to take care of us and we show no concern for how we are expected to take care of the gods. But as far as remote viewers are concerned, uh, as I look at the remote viewing community, there's a big interest in can we communicate with aliens? In fact, one remote viewer, Angela Townsend Smith, claims and has written a book about her extensive remote viewings of aliens and, and what their needs and desires and interest in us might be. And that's, I think, indicative of, of an interest which has been there in the remote viewing community from the beginning. But in terms of survival after death, well, I, I know a number of prominent remote viewers have had near-death experiences. So, there's that. And people who have had near-death experiences uh, also seem to be people... Uh, such as are described, uh, such as Peter Kingsley describes Carl Jung after his journey into the underworld. Well, we know there are thousands and thousands of people who have had near death experiences. And I can tell you this. Many of them come back very confused. They didn't intend to, uh, have a spiritual awakening. It's not, their desire necessarily to live a life in behalf of a, a larger spiritual community of the living and the dead, for the most part, uh, they just like to get back to their life as it was. And, and they find that this is no longer possible. They've had too many insights. 
And how are they going to integrate these insights into the life that they used to live? It becomes a, a matter of psychological integration that often takes decades. And you'll see that amongst near-death experiencers, a, a process of reintegration and, uh, well, that's probably the best word, reintegration that takes decades before they write their first book about it, typically. I think you'll see that that was true, for example, of uh, the recent interview I did with Elizabeth Crone on the power of the near-death experience. Uh, her experience occurred decades before she was ready to even co-author that book, Changed in a Flash, co-authored with Professor Jeffrey Kripal. And there are many other examples like that. People don't just you know, wake up from a near-death experience and are ready to go out and lecture and talk about it. It doesn't work that way. Even in the case of uh, a best-selling author like Eben Alexander, the process took years before he was uh, willing and able to go public to become a communicator of a larger reality. But people uh, in, like Ed May don't seem to have that problem. And when you look at remote viewing, in general, it seems to be designed as a tool to aid in the affairs of the living. The, the funding came from largely out of the U.S. government intelligence community from the CIA and, and other agencies. <laughs> The military provided that funding, and today remote viewing is used extensively, um, to the extent it's used at all, really. Uh, it, it, it's used by law enforcement. It's used by people who are trying to find things that they've lost. It's used for medical diagnosis, the, uh, the whole field of uh, medical clairvoyance, and uh, it's also used by people who want to speculate in the financial markets or invest, uh, speculate really, in horse races and uh, athletic events. So it's used to serve the purposes of the living. But on the other hand, psychic healing is not uh, strictly used that way. Of course, healing is for the living, but I, my sense is that psychic healers in general are very often in touch with the departed and, and in communication with the departed. And a, a classic example of this is my friend Jane Catra, who uh, is the co-author with Russell Targ of uh, several books, The Heart of the Mind being one of them. And in those books, she describes how Jane, who was a healer, was guided by the spirit of uh, the then deceased remote viewer, Hella Hammett, who had worked extensively with Russell Targ. And she was guided by Hella to go to a uh, meeting of the Parapsychological Association where she met with Russell Targ and uh, initiated a relationship with him that led to his being healed from cancer because shortly after they got together, he received a, a very grim warning from his doctor that he had cancer of the liver, that spots on the liver were there, and that he might have as little as six months to live. Now, Jane worked with him. Basically, she said, you don't know that you have cancer. All you know is that that's what the doctor said. We're going to work to, so that you never had cancer in the first place. And they engaged in a very intensive period uh, for, I think, six weeks or longer to uh, work on visualization and uh, inner psychological processes to heal him. And then when he went back for, I think, a, an MRI or a CAT scan, some more detailed analysis to look at those spots on his liver, they were gone. So, in, in effect, <laughs> yeah, the doctor said, well, I guess you never had it in the first place. <laughs> So, what exactly happened isn't clear, but it was a larger form of healing, and it set Russell, who was a you know, remote viewing researcher, on, on a path of spiritual inquiry. And the, and the result of that, you will know on the New Thinking Aloud channel, various interviews with Russell talking about his deep interest in Buddhist philosophy. 
in non-attachment and in non-duality, for example. So healing and this sense of communication, this sense of continuity of consciousness, as uh, Stephen Schwartz described it in a previous interview I've done with him, the continuity of consciousness that we are one community, the living and the dead. That is a sentiment commonly expressed by healers, not commonly expressed by remote viewers, commonly, I, I think, implicit, not usually uh, explicitly expressed, but it's a, it's a point of view that's implicit amongst many of the researchers in parapsychology who are concerned uh, about the question of uh, survival after death. And amongst those researchers who are not concerned with that question, who consider themselves physicalists or materialists, who believe that uh, the question of precognition, clairvoyance, telepathy will ultimately be explained like everything else in science at this point is largely everything that is explained. Of course, there are many things that are not explained yet in science, but it will eventually be incorporated into a physicalist, materialist paradigm. So, the point being here that a non-material paradigm, a spiritual paradigm, a paradigm that considers a continuity of consciousness between the living and the dead, that's a very different worldview than the worldview that basically says when the dead are dead, they're dead. They're gone. There is no more consciousness. That's it. Lights out. Period than a view that says we really are living in a world where we're surrounded by the dead. We're not only surrounded by the dead, we're surrounded by aliens, we're surrounded by deities, devas, elementals, demons, <laughs> satanic forces, a whole super sensible world out there. And what are we to make of it? So, there are two distinct worldviews. And in one of those worldviews, we live for ourselves. We live to enrich and enhance our materialistic life. And that's the worldview that, according to Peter Kingsley, has led us to the brink of our own self-destruction, largely at our own hands. And let's face it, the situation is dire. Dire. I think... uh I have many political disagreements with uh, some of our viewers who consider themselves right-wing. I don't. I, I consider right-wing to be <laughs> bad. But, but I, I think we can agree on, on this, that our situation is dire. In fact, maybe uh, that's something that moderates might not agree uh, with. I don't know. Moderates might say, let's continue to make small progress. But if our situation is dire, it means that we really have to make a major change. And if our situation is dire, could it possibly be because a high percentage of people are living only for the living? and not for the whole continuity of consciousness on this planet? Is, is the pollution, is the uh, oppression, is, is <laughs> the racism, and <laughs> I don't think racism is our biggest problem, but oppression is a big problem, whether it's racial or sexual or uh, simply a question of the weak and the strong. But if we live only for ourselves, is, is that leading us to destruction? Or, you know, people might argue just the converse, that, that if we try to live for everybody, that's what will lead to our destruction. But maybe that, again, is referring everybody, meaning only the living. What if we try to live for the continuity, the community of living and dead altogether? Is that our way to escape our, destru our destruction, our doom? Or is it too late in any case? I don't have all of the answers, but at least it seems to me 
based on Peter Kingsley's analysis that, that we can make some interesting distinctions between those who acknowledge the uh, continuity of consciousness with those who have departed and those who don't. And now in parapsychology, we have a lot of evidence. We have the evidence from people who have had near-death experiences and have come back to report what they have encountered. We have the evidence from mediumship, and I think one of the strongest cases there is uh, reported in my interview with Vernon Neppy on the chess game from beyond the grave. Apparently, uh, the uh, great chess player Reza Marashi, or Maraxi, who, who died in the 1950s, came back nearly half a century later, or about half a century later, to play a game of chess with a grandmaster, Victor Korknoy, Russian grandmaster chess player. And uh, in Nepi's detailed analysis of that game, we see the personality of Maraxi coming through, not just the personality in terms of his style of playing, but the skill to play at the level of a grandmaster in chess against another grandmaster. That seems to me to be highly evidential. But we also have, in addition to that, uh, the studies of cases of reincarnation. And it's very clear now that young children, thousands by the thousands, have reported their memories of past lifetimes with great detail, with such detail that researchers are able to come back and identify the family, and they go and visit those families, and they can uh, recognize their their former loved ones and, and recognize them at the emotional level. Now, I know some of the viewers who are uh, fundamentalist Christians say, oh, this is all demonic, that those demons are so clever, they, they're able to impersonate uh, the past lifetime by feeding this information to the young children to create the illusion of reincarnation because it's not in the Bible and therefore can't exist. And well, if you want to treat the Bible that way, it's, it's your privilege. And frankly, I've, I haven't deleted those posts. If you look on our reincarnation interviews, you'll see those posts are there. But I have to say, in balance, the evidence more strongly favors the reincarnation hypothesis than the hypothesis that this is all some sort of demonic trickery. But even if you accept the demonic trickery uh, hypothesis, you still are dealing with some sort of r- supersensible realm. And then we have to begin to ask ourselves, where did this so-called demonic realm come from? And what is its purpose? And why is it interacting with us? And uh, at that point, you you might wish to accept the traditional fundamentalist interpretations, which are fraught, I can tell you, with philosophical difficulties, because if God created the demonic realm, since God created everything, uh, and the demonic, and God is all good, since God is the ultimate good, well, then the demonic realm, how, how can it really be bad? That, that's a, a fundamental problem for uh, traditional uh, Christian and, and even non-Christian interpretations of, of the demonic realm. In any case, from a research point of view, we have the data of reincarnation. We have the data uh, from mediums and, and the chess game from the dead being the outstanding example. The data from people who have had near-death experiences. And we have the long-standing philosophical, religious, and shamanistic traditions of communication with a supersensible world of which we partake, as well as the testimony of depth psychologists like Carl Jung, who is maintaining that the psyche, the depths of the human psyche, are not purely subjective. They are objective. They are ontologically real. He is describing a realm in which the human beings, through dreams and visions and uh, active imagination, are participating in a, uh, you could say, co-creating with the departed, and with a, a, a whole other 
not just the, uh, the departed, but I think it's fair to say with the archetypes, with the deities, the devas, whatever you want to call these entities, even if you wish to call them, you know, nothing more than uh, projections of our own depths, they seem to have an autonomous existence. And, and that's another debate, the autonomy of uh, spiritual entities. There's one final point I'd like to conclude with, and that is that a number of viewers to my previous monologue mentioned my enthusiasm. And yes, I'm very enthusiastic, but it's in that same enthusiasm that I discovered a warning from Peter Kingsley. I'm going to read it. Let me just put on my glasses and read his exact words to you for a moment. He says, Another point worth emphasizing would be how overwhelmingly tempting it can be in the intensity of one's enthusiasm to snatch at the fragments of wisdom intended to offer access to a reality beyond the ego and use them to strengthen the ego instead. That's a risk that I'm sure Peter Kingsley felt he himself was facing. It's a risk that I face. It's a risk that every viewer faces. That in our enthusiasm, like, oh, wow, I'm grasping a spiritual truth. It's taking me to another level. I even used the phrase in my last monologue of and how I felt I had initiated myself. Well, that, why not pat myself on the back for that? So, I think uh, Peter Kingsley's warning is that every time we think we're making spiritual progress, we could be doing the exact opposite. And he certainly has felt that all of the people, uh, the armies of Jungian therapists who are out there and are proclaiming the importance of Carl Jung's psychology are at the same time diminishing it. That's a paradox. And I'll leave you with that thought. How does that paradox operate in your life? So thank you once again for being with me.